Hi, is this William? Yes, hi, is this Tiffany? Yes, it is. Let me do the official introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, we are very excited to welcome our featured guest for this evening. He is an actor who, of course, you fondly remember from projects like Herman's Head and Fright Night, and he's joining us to talk about his new film, When We Dance, The Music Dies. We're very excited to welcome William Ragsdale to the show. You're on the air with Terry and Tiffany. Welcome. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's nice to be here. appreciate it. Big fan here, William. After tonight, I can say that collectively we've kind of had your whole cast on because <laughs> having you on, we've also had Catherine Mary Stewart and uh, Eric Roberts on the show. Oh, wow. Great. Okay. All right. Well, that's, uh, that's good. That's three for three. Then. That's perfect. <laughs> now, now, I've got to ask you, uh, of course... As an actor, okay, we all worry about typecasting and stuff and so on, and, and you're so known for Fright Night, and I want to talk a little bit about that too, but how do you feel about coming back into a movie that kind of rises uh, the hair on the back of your neck? First of all, do you really think it's a horror movie? Is it a thriller? What do you think it is, and how do you feel about coming back into something that's kind of perfect for Halloween time? <laughs> uh, exactly. Yeah, I um, I. I feel good about it i mean i was i grew up on that stuff i grew up on uh you know all the hammer films and all the the uh the night gallery and all the stuff that does exactly that sort of raises the hair on your your neck and so this was a a fun project it's it's a bit more mysterious you know i kind of it it has uh virtually no uh blood and gore and guts um but on the on the positive side um it uh it it's kind of a mysterious and it, it is what you, what you say sort of spooky and i don't know it just feels it feels like a very comfortable fit for me i like i like the mystery and the spooky as as much as you know the abject horror i guess right now it, it's really something that unfortunately some people can relate to in the fact of, of a missing child and you play which is probably the most horrific horrific thing that could ever happen to anybody you play a father and you're really in, in despair because your daughter becomes missing. I mean, luckily, you've never had to face anything like that. I know you have three children yourself, uh, sons, I believe. Uh, what did yeah. you draw from that? I mean, did you talk to parents that have lost their child and what it's like? I mean, what was your basic basis for, for how your character would react to such a situation? Yeah, there's um, there's a there's a little bit of sort of an emotional buffer because uh, it, it is my daughter, but she's like college age, so it's not yeah. like losing you know losing someone that you're uh, imminently responsible for you know and and blaming yourself. She's she's sort of on her own and she's in college and then she gets involved with this silly uh, little you know spooky game that they play with her roommates and. And then, in fact, as you say, she 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 goes missing. So it's kind of more of a mystery than, uh, you know. I mean, that vulnerability of losing a small child is is not there, but the the mystery of trying to find someone you care about is there. So, uh, and that's you know, and that sort of I think that sort of relieves the the anxiety part of it, mm-hmm. but you know, but it still allows you know the mystery part of it to remain. Right. Now, I wanted to ask, uh, how did you end up getting involved in this project? I had read online that uh, the director, Anthony de Lioncourt, was actually a, f- a William Ragsdale fan. So did he approach you? Was this an audition? How did this happen? Yeah, no, it was an audition. I, I had gotten the, uh, the the breakdown and stuff from my agent who said, you know, if, if you're interested, uh, you know, why don't you go in for this? And I, I, I looked at the outline and... Uh, and a bit of a script, and I thought, oh, this is different, and 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 could be a lot of fun. So I went and just read like a you know a normal audition and or something. And uh, uh, Anthony, the the director and producer, he he seemed a little glazed or something when I went in, and I said, do you want me to do it again? He said, no, 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 that was fine. And I thought, well, okay, that's you know at least I went in and gave it my shot. I you know I enjoyed it, I enjoyed reading it and working on it, and then. Uh, Later, I found out that he was actually a big Fright Night fan. He and Matt, <laughs> or uh, Mark Matson, who who was the producer as well, were were both Fright Night fans, and, and they they were not sure what to say, and I wasn't sure what to say. <laughs> but it, it kind of it kind of all worked out, you know, kind of kind of took on a life as, of its own, I guess. It's really hard for me when I have my idols on the show, and come to find out, I guess 
directors and producers get starstruck too. So you know that's <laughs> <laughs> well, exactly right. I mean, that's because you know, I mean, if you're horror or sci-fi people, you know, you you sort of grow up with. Uh, these movies and the, the people in them, you know, sort of take on a life of their own, I guess. Yeah. And, and yeah, and you, you you run into it, and you're 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 a, a fan as much as a, as an employer, I guess, or whatever, you know, sure. creator. I mean, what did he tell you as far as the character? Uh, of course, there's a script to read, and that's the Bible. You got to kind of go by that. But what did he tell right. you as far as what your character would be like or based on? Well, it was uh, interestingly. It was kind of it was kind of minimal. I mean, it was sort of I won't say minimal, but it was a uh, it was kind of a bait. You know, he sort of t- told me what the what the beginning of the story was, mm-hmm. which is that uh, my character, who is the father of this this young woman in college, um, gets a call that his daughter has disappeared, and it turns out it's part of this kind of odd little you know sort of campfire game that they that these girls play um but then it turns out that it's it's related later on in in the film you find out that there's actually a cult sort of quality to it and 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 an actual cult uh cult that eric roberts is the head of um and they become involved in it as well so it's, it's it's a mystery as well as a uh you know kind of a, a spooky thing and and when i first got the breakdown and saw it i wasn't entirely sure what was going on but that was kind of fun too you know i was like well we'll just figure this thing out as we go and it definitely incorporates something in the fact as if i wasn't afraid of elevators anyway (laughs) (laughs) yeah right because it it kind of involves an elevator and she does a certain sequence of the elevator and it kind of leads her to somewhere that she shouldn't have been going to and and I, I don't know. There's just there's something about an elevator anyway. You ever have any appreh- apprehensions about riding an elevator? Well, not uh, not until you just described it. <laughs> that way. But, uh, you know, but yeah, I mean, it's true. You know, you get on a you get in a, in a very small room that's hanging on a cable, and you trust it to get you you know where you're you're supposed to go. And you know, I mean, that's that's a big sort of a big trust experiment, I guess, which we take for granted day to day but uh you know and then you know it's i suppose there's a little bit of technology and and uh you know putting your immediate future into um you know kind of a precarious position but i'm um i yeah i mean i i guess i haven't thought about it too much but i I, you know several years ago there was a video of a woman getting into a, a an elevator that seemed to kind of take over her personality and then she disappears and so it's you know it's, i guess it's a metaphor for any sort of journey you start to take yeah one of the things that i thought was really interesting i want to let our listeners know uh, about william in this film is that and, and you can comment to this william is that your character was very a stark contrast from a lot of characters that you've played and that you're known for. You're quite often known, you know, for, like I mentioned at the top of the the interview, Herman's Head, which is like this light comedy thing, and then Fright Night, which was horror but had comedy in it. Your character in this film gets very dark, a little bit manic, and kind of goes off the rails at points. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, because he's 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 alone. He finds himself, you know, even his wife is like, come on, it's, you know, it's over, it's done, it's she's not coming back and and there's something in him that doesn't quite that doesn't connect with and so he keeps looking and he loses you know loses his his wife and there are allusions to him losing his job and you know but it's kind of becomes an obsession with him and and in that sense i guess the psychologically it's not something that i'm i'm really known for and i am usually the audience is completely on my side you know right in in, in the in the run of things and this is like a little bit more like what's this guy's problem why is he not <laughs> you know well, yeah so th- they they follow me as opposed to uh you know i guess me following what the you know uh, what you expect out of the movie well i must say it was very shocking to me and it showed your depth as an actor because you know everybody's used to you being kind of the, the guy next door and, and friendly and, and open and reachable and and you know real nice guy and and you're a nice guy in the movie but 
between being manic, there's a lot of times to where you're almost emotionless in in the fact that you can just tell that you're just like in your own head, in your own little world, and and it had to be very different to do that for you. Yeah, it was you know in a in a way it was kind of a lonely project yeah. because uh, this this the setup is that you know that that and it's even sort of a, a sort of a preamble that what this event is and then. Uh, that my my daughter plays this game and, and disappears, and the rest of the movie is sort of me trying to figure out where she could have gone and what could have happened and what she could have experienced, and and you know and there aren't there's really no one there to kind of go with me. There's there, there's a love interest who's who's played by an actress named Emily Stokes who who comes along, but even she doesn't really know what's going on. I mean it's. You know, it's it's a mystery. When I I I saw it, I was sort of reminded of uh, you know, like it sort of has it like a kind of a David Lynch feel. It's like you know you you're so used to being kind of ahead of the game in movies and plots and all that stuff. And this is like, well, I don't know what's going to happen in that. You know, right. uh, or I don't really know what's going on or what to expect. And that's I don't know. I I, I find that very interesting. And we're, we're we're standing here looking at each other because oh my god. When we were watching the movie, we said this is very David Lynch like. <laughs> you hit it right oh, okay, on the head. Yeah, yeah, yeah oh, good. <laughs> wow. Right, well, that's a sampling. That's a that's a, an unbiased sampling of opinion. And that's, yeah, that's good. <laughs> so, what was the? Yeah, it sort of reminded me a little bit, and and, and not to overhype it or anything, mm-hmm. but it, it, there was a uh, sort of a Kubrick thing too, which was like because visually it's yes. like very uh, striking. Right? And your uh, and the stuff that goes on visually is as much a part of the story as sort of plot wise. And so I sort of thought I, when I first saw it, I sort of thought this is kind of a Lynch and Kubrick mix, which mm-hmm. was you know delightfully unsure, but kind of worked at the same time. It, it right? worked in, in a subtle way. I was so glad uh, the filmmakers went kind of subtle. Uh, but yet, great visuals. I mean, okay, it involves another dimension, and and you know, without giving away too much, how do you show another dimension? I mean, that's something you could really go over the top, and he did it well, and it didn't go too far over the top, and and it just it was done very well. Right, exactly, yeah, and 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 there, yeah, it's sort of a subtle version. Of, it's it's sort of implant. It's like a dreamlike thing where there it sort go. of implants the confusion that. You, you you think you're following, but you know it's also a ride at the same time. It's like you you have no you, you, there's no sense of it being directed, you know, or, or, or what direction you're going in it. Right, definitely. So I know that uh, the film obviously we've screened it. The film is complete. Do you know what the future of the film is right now? I mean, where can listeners go to see it right now, or is it going to be doing the film festival circuit? What's happening with the film now? <laughs> Yeah, I think it's being shopped around to uh, a number of uh, film festivals and stuff, and they're you know waiting to hear back on that. I don't, you know, I don't really know. I mean, it's such a, a fluid sort of world about where things get shown and how you find things. So I don't, I really don't know what the plans are with it, and you know, and it, I assume, changes kind of from week to week. But right. I hope it's available, you know, public, uh, you know, in a sort of a mass public way, but. Um, I'm not sure. I, I, I don't really know. I think they were trying to, initially. I thought that I think that they were hoping that some sort of uh, streaming service like Netflix or something might pick it up. But you know, it could easily be uh, you know sci-fi or something like that as well. I don't. I'm not really sure. The the movie. You know, I have to be careful not to give it away because. Tiffany says I'm really bad at he's that. He's really bad at that. So. <laughs> he's but, like, he's like, let me give you a hint about the sky. It's blue and it's called the sky. I'm like, that's not a hint. <laughs> but to me, the the ending kind of leaves it up to interpretation of the audience. It, it's kind of like open ended. It can go either way. W- was it possibly suggesting that there might be more, or would you know, or was the ending at any point changed during the uh, the filming? You know, I your guess is as good as mine on that because I, you know, I think it's sort of a I think it's supposed to allude to uh, until you find your answer, you will continue on with it. I mean, no matter you know, you're, you're he's following it wherever it leads, and mm-hmm. it, and for him that means 
walking in his daughter's footsteps. Right. So I, I'm not exactly sure. You know, it's not, I mean, that's one of the things that's uh, different about it. It's, it's not really concluded. So yeah. I'm not, I don't really know. Uh, you know, I, I, I guess it could use, you know what, it could, it could use another half an hour or 45 minutes of, you know, right. uh, of, uh, of journey, I think, maybe possibly. But I don't know. There you go. I mean, that that's a good question. I mean, it's it's kind of up to interpretation, and I didn't know from whether maybe it had been edited that way or, you know, if that was the way they intended it, but, it, it, you know, it could go from there, that's for sure, even if in another film, you know, so definitely. I want to ask right, about... It's, 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 go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. I want to ask about Eric Roberts, because we love him so much, and, and he's a, a funny guy, and I got to know, was there any breaking up or anything during your scenes with him? Of course, he plays a cult leader. But he he's a funny guy. I mean, was he pretty straightforward and, and just stuck to the script? Was there any ad-libbing? Was there any outtakes? I mean, what, what about working with Eric? Well, Eric is... I worked with him a couple of times, actually. And he's... One of the things that's great about working with him is that he you can read the script and you can imagine Eric Roberts doing it, but when he does it, it's like he finds things in it and expresses things in it that you don't, that you, that you miss or that you haven't received. And, mm-hmm. and, uh, so it's kind of like it, you know, he's like, um, some sort of trick shot in, in billiards, you know, it just, you think you know what's going to happen and suddenly all this other stuff happens. And right. it's always, uh, more interesting and more creative and you know you feel at the time honestly when you're doing it you're like why don't where are we going with this what's happening (laughs) but when you see it when you see it put together you know when you see it in the end result it's like oh my god that's like fantastic so i can't say that he was you know i'm not going to say he was bubbly bubbly and goofy and fun because he wasn't but he was uh but there was an underlying intelligence, I think, about what was what the end thing was going to be, and uh, and I think that he delivered it magnificently. I do too. He's such a method actor. I wouldn't be drinking any Kool Aid if he served you any. Because, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, if you did, you better be you know make sure that your seatbelt is fastened and you know and you're you're going for the ride. I mean, he's very creative and. You know, he's part of that old school uh, kind of uh, school of acting, which says, you know, I don't need to know what's going to happen right. next. You know, we're going to find out what happens next. And, uh, you know, and that's kind of, you know, if you're on the planning end of things or the editing and, and, and expect, you know, expecting a certain thing, if you're on that end of things, I can understand it being a little scary, but as a as a performer and as a, as an actor, it's exciting right. and scary. <laughs> well, after your big heyday in the '80s, when you know you came out as uh, Charlie Brewster and all the other things that you did, you did an awful lot of television. Of course, you did television back then with Herman's Head, but a lot of television mm-hmm. afterwards. Do you prefer doing movies uh, to television? Are you going to be more towards the uh, movie end now? Now that you're you're doing films again and. Well, you know, I mean, it just depends. I mean, the the the, the movie market has changed so much. Oh, I mean, yeah. you have there's no there's no sort of middle area anymore. You do, you know, uh, Marvel or uh, you know DC versions of things, <laughs> or you do or you do uh, you know you do things that guys with their you know who are borrowing cameras and writing their own scripts do. I mean, that's sort of the the you know the. The, the range of things now and um, I mean for me honestly you know obviously the, the smaller stuff is where it's going to be happening and you know I mean it's, when you have as an artist for any kind of art when you have uh, lower uh, feelings of um, or, or lower realizations of of risk or penalty I guess I should say then this stuff tends for me to be more interesting because you can kind of you can tweak it you can move it you can you know you can you can be more experimental which is always more interesting right. it's more interesting as an artist i think well Hollywood's was definitely a, a business and i know according to my notes here uh, there was an awful lot of roles that you were up for that, that went to other people i don't know if you ever have any regrets but according to this uh you were up for the christian slater role went to christian for the name of the rose 
uh, Jonathan Silverman, <laughs> Weekend at Bernie's, Patrick Dempsey in the Mood, Frank Whaley, Field of Dreams, and River Phoenix in uh, Sneakers. And you were supposed to be opposite Cher in Mask. You were supposed to be the Eric Stoltz role in Mask. Is that right? Well, I was supposed to be. I was, one, you know, I was one of the guys that was, you know, in contention, and and you know, I met with Peter Bogdanovich and stuff, and you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, you at the time you don't think of it as oh you know this is you know this is make or break um you know but yeah i mean if you're i guess if you're in the business long enough that's uh you know that you know that's just a part of it i mean i also used to when I, when i was younger and in my 20s and stuff i used to run into brad pitt all the time at auditions and stuff you know and we sort of had a repartee and you know it was just like oh you still here yeah that's good role blah 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 and then one day I go to a movie, Thelma and Louise, and he's got this nice little part, and I thought, oh, good for him. You yeah. know what? It's nice he landed that thing. And then, you know. <laughs> now, see, you're, you're a nice <laughs> so guy. I, I would be like yeah. that, that bastard, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I mean, but if the other guy is a nice guy, and you're, you know, and he's going through the same thing you are, yeah. and, you know, and he happens to, you know, catch the Hail Mary at the end, you know, to, to win the whatever Super Bowl, then that's, you know. You can't be angry about that. You can't be upset about it. It's just—it's the nature of the business. I mean, there's, there are, uh, you know, there are stories on both ends of that. You know, there are people who are great, and you, you know, you, and you wonder whatever happened to them. And there are people who are, uh, you know, good or average, and they become superstars. And that's, you know, and that, and you know, that does take adjusting to because it does it sort of goes against the sense of the well, justice of things but i'm very i'm very happy for brad I'm well you know if, if i was you i'd have been you know sad that i missed out on mass but it was okay because you still got to act with laura dern in another movie so <laughs> yeah yeah speaking yeah. of david lynch you know i mean wow I, I think she's beautiful but i will tell you this you were the uh way less annoying lead in in mannequin in the second <laughs> film <laughs> Well, way less annoying than the first guy. <laughs> first guy, yeah, I can't remember his name. Um, yeah, well, thank you. That's, that's, it's nice, nice to hear. Yeah, it was fun. It was, uh, it was. Uh, that was a good experience too. You know, it was. It, it's nice when you do a sequel because people sort of, you're sort of plugging into something that's already there. You right. know, and and so you don't have to wonder what's going to happen and. Uh, and that was good, you know. It kind of feels a little bit like the safety net. But now, in general, how do you, how, as an actor, how do you feel about uh, sequels in general? Because I know you did, obviously, you did Mannequin Two, and you did Fright Night Two, um, but you haven't done a yeah. whole lot of sequels to stuff. And, and sometimes actors love them, and sometimes actors are like, I don't want to rehash this whole thing again. Yeah, you know, I did, I did Fright Night because I thought it was, you know. It was clearly uh, a fun ride, and I thought, okay, well, there's a lot, and it's a vamp, it's a whole genre, it's a vampire right. genre. So I thought there, there could be a lot more going on there, and 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 I got to work with Roddy again, which was uh, fantastic, and you know, and so that was good. I mean, I haven't been, you know, there's no there's no sequel to Mannequin Two, which is probably uh, you know <laughs> probably good, uh, but uh, yeah, I don't, you know, if something is as long as it's is as the people are still trying and, and you know and trying to make something original and fun and you know not just you know plugging in a different girlfriend actress mm -hmm. for you know the same movie then mm -hmm. you know I, uh, I I don't have any problem with it I, I, I like it I mean there are obviously there are there are, uh, there are uh, franchises that I wouldn't mind them stopping but i'm not okay. involved in any of those so. I, I think you were slightly ahead of your time like if you look at herman's head and, and then the big hit later on was the office i think herman's head was kind of the office before the office you know <laughs> wouldn't you say uh right yeah yeah there was definitely that uh in, that office uh personality interplay going yeah. on yeah and yeah i mean it was a little bit of a, uh, ahead of its time but and you know, it was a weird. That was an early Fox, so it was like they weren't even sure what they were doing. They had Living Color and Married with Children, and you know, I mean, they were just kind of. If it was original and different, 
they liked it. Right. And, yeah. you know, and that was, that's a pretty good place to be. It, it, it wasn't like a themed evening like, you know, a lot of television became. But, right. Right. Yeah, that was fun. Well, we've spent 26 minutes without actually talking about Fright Night yet, so I've got to say something about it. I, I loved your comment. I, I saw an interview with you, and they had asked you about the Fright Night remake, and you were like, you were very nice, as you always were, and you said, well, it has its own fans. It's none of them here, but... <laughs> Because you were at a Friday night reunion, but I actually I've had Tom Holland on several times. I love Tom; he's a friend of mine. And uh -huh. when yeah, I first yeah. met Tom, I apologized to him for them fucking his movie up when they made that remake <laughs> because the remake was so right. bad. Now that you think about it, do you still are you still kind of nice about it, or have you ever went back and watched it and really? I'm putting words in your mouth. I don't want to do that. Have you ever really saw how bad that remake was? <laughs> well, I, you know what? I have friends on both sides of the, sides of the aisle. Yeah. And uh, I, I had actually the weirdest thing for me was that because I was in LA in, at that point, and um, the advertising campaign was almost identical to the to what it had been when I you know for the movie that I had been right. done 20 years earlier so I'm I'm like literally stuck in traffic following a bus with a fright night ad on it <laughs> and I'm thinking well that's you know this is weird I, this is like almost this is like a Twilight Zone episode itself you know I can't <laughs> there's the movie that Mike you know the guy playing me is is in and you know I mean it's, that was uh surreal i suppose but you know i at the same time i had my manager at the time had had been able to get me the original script of the remake which mm -hmm. was by a great writer named monty narkson uh or marty uh, noxon who i thought it was a really good script actually i thought oh this is a great because it was working in the the recession you know the 2009 recession yeah. or whatever with the frightening thing and it was i thought it was very clever um but you know, did it need to be redone? I, geez, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I wasn't aware that anything that, that it, it was going to improve upon. And, it, it was uh, so hard. I, uh, it was so hard for my daughter, who's the other host here, because she's a big David Tennant fan, Doctor Who, and all that, and to know oh, that, yeah, that yeah. yeah, that he was in. Well, there. I love David, but I was like, oh, you can't touch Roddy. No, yeah. no, please don't, please don't. Well, do you know, that. I mean, those, I mean, especially that character, that and Evil Ed, they were so different. Yeah, from, they were even written differently from from the original characters, and I sort of like the idea of a Chris Angel, you know, you know, sort of gothy magician guy getting caught up in this thing. I, I thought that was kind of a clever idea. Uh, and for its time, it was not dissimilar from yeah. uh, from what, who Roddy was, which was the late night TV host. I mean, they're, they're sort of generationally similar, you know, mm -hmm. even though they're, they're quite different. And, um, and the guy who played uh, Evil Ed in the, in the remake, you know, I mean, he was much more bitter it seemed like about who he was right. but you know that's probably true of that generation you know of the generation too mm -hmm. so you yeah. know no. I, I thought it was a worthy idea but uh, you know uh, and i don't know how do you guys how do you guys from the original cast i mean you and 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 chris and and amanda and steven and all and, and well all of you guys feel about Fright Night now, I mean, when you guys get together at these reunions, I mean, it's been 30 years since the original Fright Night. Uh, is, it, yeah. is it just like old times, like no time has passed, or do you guys just sit there and go, we had no idea this movie would have this kind of a, of a duration, this this much legs? It, it's October, dude, and this is the Halloween movie to see is the original Fright Night. <laughs> right. That's for sure. Yeah, no, yeah, it's every, I, I, I'm, I'm on, uh, I, I see the people, uh, Posting things like, oh, I, I saw you on this, and, you know, and then every October it's like, you know, it's sort of like, uh, you know, it it it, uh, it explodes with activity. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, as a group, we we are still very close. I mean, we sort of just got each other right out of the gate, and and I think that really helped, you know, in 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 the making of the movie. But it's still true today. I mean, everybody's still. Uh, 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 simpatico even 
in our, you know, even now that we've moved on in our own lives right. and stuff, mm -hmm. there's just a, a camaraderie that is kind of innate. It works for the movie, but it's true in real life as I well. I was really surprised because, I, I don't know, I, I, I should have guessed with, with Amanda, with her having a sense of humor and playing that crazy character she played in Married with Children. And directing a lot. And, and directing that she would have loved it. But I had really feared that Amanda just hated Fright Night, but she does it. She's very supportive of it, right? Oh, yeah. No, no. She was, she, she loves it. I mean, we were, you know, we were, when we did it, we were really flying under the radar because we were just uh, supposed to be, uh, you know, another little quickie summer horror, you know, teenage horror movie, you know, and which there had already been a number of by that point. And um, so we were all very kind of relaxed, I guess, you know, and just kind of having fun with it. And um, so it wasn't like, and there were no, there were no prima donna stars that were making everybody miserable. Well, we were just a bunch of, you know, people making... Uh, uh, a movie where you know and all kind of like theater trained so we're you know serious about it and and uh making this movie and you know i mean there was nothing really to be dismissive about on a personal level about right. it and we we loved going to work together because it was always you know we made each other laugh and we and and we're serious about the plot and of course you know tom he was extremely serious about oh, yeah. it uh, the plot and following, you know, the the uh, whatever I guess principles of of the genre, you know, and he was and it was kind of a sacred thing to him. Right. So, uh, we, so so we 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 took it very seriously, and you know, and when everybody's doing their best work, then you know, there's there's an innate appreciation that that gets instilled in everybody. Well, you yeah. you say there was no prima donnas, and I, I very much doubt if there was. But you had one screen legend that was with you, and that was Ronnie McDowell. I, I am in such awe of you, William, for having worked <laughs> with this man. Yeah. I mean, to me, I mean, I saw all the Planet of the Apes films, you know. Well, the Legend right, of Hell right. House. Legend and, of Hell yeah. House. I mean, it would have been great if Vincent Price, who I, I was so lucky to have met him. I didn't meet Roddy, but I did get to hang out with oh, Vincent wow. Price. It would have been great if he could have done the role, but I guess he was sick in the cast. Ronnie McDowell. Did he give you any advice? Because you were a relatively young man, and Roddy started out when he was a kid in movies. He, yeah, Roddy started out, and you know when he was twelve or something. Yeah. He was under, you know, his his classmates at the MGM uh, or the, uh, Universal School, I don't know, Universal or MGM, but uh, you know he was he was in it under the studio system. He was there with uh, you know with uh, Mickey Rooney and Elizabeth Taylor. Mm -hmm. You know. He was, Wow. when they were kids and um, um, but yeah you know he was such a he had been through every level of it yeah. and you know and he knew he knew it at its core how how great it could be when it was great and how lonely it could be when it's you know when it's not great so he wasn't he, he didn't bring any sort of uh he brought. He didn't bring any sort of unhealthy ego to it. He brought a healthy ego to it, and uh, and that was really cool to see because he was totally available to us who were newbies there. And yet you had Chris Sarandon kind of having the same googly eyed you know fascination with him as well because yeah. he had grown up on his stuff as well. Right. So he was a great mentor in that sense. You know he he was a he was. He was fun, and he was knowledgeable, extraordinarily knowledgeable, and um, and just the perfect guy for that role because he, you know, he knew those guys as well. He knew yeah. all those old, you know, vampire killer guys, Vincent is, and, and the others, and um, so he was he, he was a great person to have in that role and as a mentor for the younger people in the movie. Well, it was great that of anybody to take the role that from what I understand was supposed to be Vincent Price's because uh, he was really a good friend of Vincent's and was actually yes. <clears throat> you know together at, at uh, the deathbed side so but I wanted to find out because Roddy was pretty much up in age when he did Fright Night been around for a long time any truth to the rumor uh, that when Evil Ed uh, attacks him 
that Roddy got a little upset because uh, Stephen Jeffries was was a little physical because uh, Tom Holland told him to go for it. And I guess he really <laughs> did. Is that true? Yeah. Well, I don't. I only know that from what Stephen said, and 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 Stephen said that he that Roddy thought it was a little. Uh, roughish but you know i mean yeah as you say i mean roddy was no spring chicken in those days and to have a 20 year old guy jump on his back and you know throwing him around i guess yeah i can understand he would maybe want to <laughs> 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 so many I mean, at, at, you know i don't i don't think it was ever anything <clears throat> you know as serious right. there was never any sort of what that i was aware of any sort of you know bad blood between the the two but you know, and it's also like you know, like I'm saying, if you if you read in a script, so and so jumps on someone goes back. You know, that's mm-hmm. as an actor, you don't even think about it. But when you're doing it, you know, at the eighth hour of a day in front of a camera, then yeah, I guess you know you can get a little more uh, prickly about it. Right. Well, it's either getting into a role too much or having accents happen. I guess you got hurt on Fright Night, right? I I did. It's a really really undramatic sort of accident. <laughs> I, was, I was running <laughs> running down some stairs and uh, Tom had wanted uh, one more take and so I ran down some stairs and I, I slipped. I was, in, I was in penny loafers running down a carpeted stair so it was uh, it was not, it didn't take a brain surgeon to figure out what might happen but uh, yeah and I had, I slipped and fell and I turned my ankle and I was hurt and I <clears throat> so I I sat there for a while and I it looked like it was swelling and stuff and they were they had the medic come over and look and say you know yeah it looks like you twisted your ankle and stuff and then the the sound man came over he said no he didn't twist it he broke it because mm. he had heard Damn. the snap on the, oh. on his headphones when when uh yeah when I had come down the stairs mm. so so he was the one the sound guy was the guy who said you should probably go to the get an x-ray and go to the hospital and sure enough yeah it was uh, the, the the doctor at the hospital said, "Oh, I hope you can run on one leg." So it was sort of the you know, and you were able to it, finish the film, and it didn't sh- show up or anything. I mean, nobody noticed. Well, if, if you don't know about it, it doesn't show up. But if you look carefully at uh, because I we had filmed all the exterior stuff before right. then, so there's a when I'm running down the alleys and I'm you know doing stuff outside, uh, you know, coming into the the, the vampire's house there's no problem because it's not broken yet but once i got inside then occasionally if you watch carefully you can see me when i'm running out of a shot it looks like i'm falling out of a shot because i'm falling out of a shot <laughs> and, and into and into <laughs> oh, oh shit oh, we, we lost, lost him. him we lost him okay all right let's give him a call back okay stupid skype okay <laughs> technology and we, we were getting to do a really good story, too. Hey, there. Sorry yes. about that. Yeah, That's no, we right. lost you for a second. <laughs> no. No, so I was just saying that I had, yeah, I fell out of frame in a number of scenes, too, you know, now, instead of running out. Right. Now, I don't know if you had heard about this or if anything, if it was just something that was talked about in an interview or if there was ever any realism to it. But uh, Tom Holland has said in, in interviews previously that he would love to do, even present day, a follow-up to Fright Night and basically do like his own sequel to it present day. I don't know if you've heard anything about this, but he's definitely talking about wanting to include you as a grown-up single uh, dad. Uh, you know, Charlie Brewster is a grown-up single dad where uh, the son would have basically have the same thing happen to him that happened to Charlie as a kid. Have you heard anything about this? Is there any truth to this at all? And would you do it? I, I Yeah, no, I, of course I would do it, but I no, I haven't, I mean, Tom, you know, is a is a dreamer, so, you know, if he, if he can dream it and write it down, then I, I think it'd be great. Um, you know, I don't know, I don't uh, I don't I think it would probably work better now is, you know, uh, something that they do now, which is is great as they do these little short run sort of mini series things, and mm-hmm. I think as that, I think it would because the you know it would cut down on the cost and the promotion and all that stuff. I think it would be a great idea, and you know, and people like you know binging and and following something for you know they like following a storyline that's more than 
an hour or two hours. So I, I think that would be a great idea. Um, and, you know, Tom would be uh, magnificent at it, but I, I haven't heard anything more about it. I, you know, it'd be terrific if it happened, but I don't know. I've talked to Chris about it, and he, he would be up for it, too. So, you know, it's certainly, it's certainly available if anybody's, you know, wants to continue with it. We can all keep our fingers crossed. Yeah. Yeah. I, I yeah. would hardly think... We, or whatever cross you want to... Right. <laughs> I, I would hardly think that Chris would have had a problem with, with doing another one because he was so great in that role. His, his wife was a bit of a cult star uh, herself, Susan Sarandon, at the time. He was married to her and, and being in Rocky Horror. I mean, he's got many conventions yeah. he could attend. <laughs> but I, I got to find out because everybody's always mentioning this uh, Fright Night sequel well not sequel it's a remake what about the sequel fright night 2 i mean how do you think that held up with one you and roddy were back which was a great thing but not everybody else was back you had some new characters uh some of which we had the actors on the show but what do you think about fright night 2 how do you think that held up well you know when it when it first came out i thought it was uh, you know i you expect it, you know, you're comparing it to the original, obviously, right. and you want it to kind of recapture that stuff, and I, I don't think it did that, uh, but, at the time, but, uh, I've, I've viewed it, reviewed it, since, since then, and it's, you know, it's, it really is kind of its own thing, too, it's, it's a really fun, for me, kind of time capsule of 80s style and and music and humor and, and and all that stuff so i think it does really sort of stand up on its own um you know and the characters are obviously very different uh, roddy and i are the only ones who return but you know it's fun it's it's a little more kind of uh what would you do? it's more mtv you know it's yeah, more right. Stylish and and kind of self commenting than the original is. I think. I, I think with a good movie but cast, uh, Grise in it because he, he was John Grise. John Grise. He, he was great. Oh yeah, as a he werewolf, was terrific. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, He's a yeah, funny guy. It was terrific. Well, I, I have to give you yeah. cra- I have to give you crap, William, because you know what? Regardless of what people think about Fright Night Two, I mean, it, it can't hold a candle to Frankenstein: The College Years, which you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's. That's really unfair. You know, that's such a <laughs> master work. Of, uh, you know, timing and everything. No, uh, yeah, well, you know, there it is. That was, uh, that was Tom Shadyac, who, um, who went on to do, uh, you know, uh, went on to do Ace Ventura and mm-hmm. Bruce Almighty, and he was the director of all those things. And he was, you know, he, that was Fox giving him, you know, this new guy a little chance to see what, he could do and and uh it was crazy right. well and, and knowing that you played ella degeneres's love interest in her uh long-lived tv series back before she uh did the talk show i think she should have you on her show now more often <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's only fair yeah. I mean, you okay. know okay <laughs> all right uh you know, I when I I did uh, I was I, I think technically I was her last boyfriend, and they had uh, and we got along really well, and, and yeah. she enjoyed having me on the show, I think. And uh, but from the la- before I did the, I did one show after she came out. I had done these other shows before, mm-hmm. you know, when I was just a standard love interest or whatever. And when I did the last show, which was after she had come out, and the the, the principle the the idea of the story is that she sort of maybe she's sure maybe she's not she sort of backslides a little bit she likes this guy and when I, there was a point when we after she had come out when I did the show when, she, when we kissed you know we had this like a little spark moment and stuff and there was a section of the audience that was not having any of that they were not going to go back uh, to the old Ellen for anything and they began booing <laughs> oh wow we were doing our kiss and I was like oh okay well I guess that's not what that's not that's not what they're looking to, uh, you know, plug into for right. the, the producers and all that stuff. But well, I can say that you know, having been happily married all these years with three sons, uh, it's a good thing people doesn't compare you with your movie characters because between Amanda and Ellen, uh, both <laughs> pitching for the other side, people would wonder about you at times. You know, but they don't have. To yeah, <laughs> yeah, you know, whatever. You know, I what can I say? You know. It's, 
<laughs> I'm sure it's random, right? <laughs> I mean, it's got to be random. <laughs> <laughs> so before yeah, I, well. before we wrap up though I wanted to ask of course uh, the, the great film When We Dance the Music Dies our listeners are going to be looking for that but there was a couple of projects that's actually listed on IMDB as being in development and you know sometimes they get it right and sometimes they get it wrong um, right. but one is called one is a horror film called When the Dead Laugh uh, is that something that's going to be happening is there anything you can tell us about that I, I don't really know about it because that's that it's sort of been in, in the works for a while, and um, it's it's a it's a guy that I knew uh, from sort of growing up, or I knew I, we have mutual friends and stuff, and he's written uh, this project, and uh, I, I I don't really sort of know where it stands. I think they're still trying to finance it or something, um, but uh, I don't really know. It's a, it's a guy named uh, Mark Manis who is uh, who is from where I'm from. From Arkansas, and we have uh, a lot of mutual friends. So I'm not really sure what's happening with it, but okay. you know, and, and it's ready to go. And another one listed is a, a thriller called Hard Place. Oh yeah, yeah. I don't honestly, I don't really know what's going on with that. That's uh, you know, it's uh, I don't know. <laughs> right. I, I sort of lend my support to people who are trying to make films, mm-hmm. and I say, yeah, yeah, if I can be of any help. And you know, if I can attach to it in any way, then and if it helps, that's uh, you know, then I'm I'm all for it. But you know, I can't. I, I'm not really at the point where I can get the financing and all that's for people. So you know, I'm just happy to be considered for being part of it. So. Well, and you know, you've certainly done a lot of different types of films, but it's pretty clear that you don't mind doing an occasional horror film or a thriller. I mean, it's not like because of Fright Night. It's like, oh, please, not another one of those. So. Oh, no, 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 not at all. I love that stuff. I grew up on all of that. Like I was saying, I grew up on the Hammer and the Night Gallery, and mm-hmm. uh, and I love it. I mean, that I love that stuff. The spookier, the better for me. So, I, you know, it's it's, it's great. You know, it's a, it's a challenge, though. I mean, we, we you know, these, because they've gotten so good. The, the scary movies, movies have gotten so good in the last 20-plus years. You know, right. it's like, I, I, you know, I don't know how people, where you go next and mm-hmm. how people you know I mean I, I don't know that you can shock people anymore I mean you can but it's um, you know that's sort of a dead end when you shock people it's like okay I mean the real world is more shocking than yeah. a lot of stuff that you can do on film so you really have to kind of it's really now about s- the storytelling and the building of it and you know and that's a very specialized task that takes a very special talent so right. But I'm I'm always up for it. But it's you know it's more challenging I think in a way. Well, I would not ask you about the new film because I'd not want you to be in a situation like that if you were the character or had a situation like the character. So we'll go to fantasy once again. If you were Charlie Brewster, how would you kill a vampire? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd probably go to whatever friend I had who knew how to kill vampires and ask him how to kill vampires. You know, I'd I'd, I'd uh, farm out my the expertise and say, what do I I do now? Probably right? your your best bet but would the, be to visit Tom Holland because <laughs> yeah, right. It'd probably be the first phone call I made. Was like, what do you think, Tom? What should I do? And, uh, well, I, I don't I, know. I want to thank you so much because I'm going to tell you, you know, doing live radio. There's many times that actors don't show up, and not only did you show up, okay, where a lot of them don't, it doesn't happen a lot, but once in a while, but you even called us last week because you were, you know, a little confused as to when you were supposed to be on, and, and so were we. the information <laughs> wasn't exactly given to you, and, and, and you were, I'm telling you, man, you're old school, you're old school like Roddy McDowell responsible, let me tell you, and I appreciate it. Oh, wow, that's high praise indeed, thank you, yeah. thank you, I appreciate that, I'll take that. Yeah, no, I'm glad. Thank you guys for for having me on. I'm I'm glad that uh, you're that you uh, you're available to talk and you know and we can see about uh, promoting this movie. Absolutely, and we would like to remind our listeners to keep an eye out for the film. The film is called When We Dance, The Music Dies. It's a great, fun, aesthetically beautiful romp. So you definitely want to to check it out. Uh, William, I want to thank you so much for spending some time with us. You have officially kicked off our month of October guests, so we are very excited to have you on tonight. Well, I'm delighted. There's no better month I would ever want to kick off than October. Thank you guys. That's true. 
I hope it's a ter- terrifying month for everyone. Yes. And, and your Halloween costume, the Charlie Brewster costume, it's easy to do. You just dress like the kid next door, so it's <laughs> cheap and you know. Yeah, you just you grab a hammer and a and a stake, and you've got your costume. <laughs> there you go. Nothing could be easier. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, William, and I hope you have a great rest of the night. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, guys. I right. appreciate uh-huh. it. Bye bye. Bye bye.